This lecture is entitled Liberal Education, History and Identity. I'm afraid that one of the risks that you take when you uh, take Keystone is uh, you don't get to choose, I suppose, uh, what discipline your instructor comes from, or maybe you do. Uh, but your instructor in this case is a historian. Um, I approach everything from a, the vantage point of history and uh, think that we can learn a lot from you know, looking back at the, at the history of a topic. Uh, and so this really is to give us a sense of what we're doing in the class, what liberal education is, um, and you know where it, where it's come from. This is not a new invention um, or a new conception. This has been around for a very long time, and I think that it helps us to understand, uh, in order to understand you know where we're at with liberal education and with education in general, we need to look at the past and and, and see where we've been. Uh, so we'll talk about the history uh, of education uh, in this lecture and. Uh, also discuss, um, you know, our, our own educational identity a little bit. Um, the, the word liberalis in Latin uh, is the is where the word liberal uh, in liberal education and liberal arts comes from. Um, the word liberal today, of course, has political connotations. It means to be on the left uh, of the political spectrum, uh, maybe associated with bigger government and things like that. Um, that use of the word liberal has nothing to do or very little to do with the tradition of liberal education and the liberal arts. Uh, the word liberalis in Latin actually means free. Um, and uh, with, with connotations of uh, use substantively, uh, liberalis means a free man. And so the liberal arts or liberal education is what a free man, legally free, uh, that is not a slave, not dependent on, on somebody else, uh, a free man would have obtained or would have desired to obtain in uh, previous eras. Um, now, you know, there's a lot more we could say about that word, uh, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about the institutional context in which free men pursued education. So we can go back in Western civilization to the ancient Greeks, uh, which is really kind of where Western civilization starts. And note that there were these institutions in ancient Greece called gymnasia. Uh, singular would be gymnasium, where we get the word gymnasium. Uh, but a gym or a gymnasium uh, in ancient Greece was not primarily or just a place to go to exercise. Uh, Physical training was an important part of education in uh, ancient Greece. Uh, physical uh, attributes were prized. Uh, people were supposed to be in shape so that they could fight uh, in the armies of the Greek city uh, that they belonged to. Um, they were supposed to be physically fit, you know, uh, because they prized athletic competition. And uh, the most physically fit, the most gifted athletes, of course, were kind of public celebrities in ancient Greece. They competed in the in the Olympic Games and the other festivals uh, and won great prizes and brought great prestige. Uh, and so the gymnasium was partly a place to uh, to be physically fit. Um, the word itself, just a little bit of trivia here, uh, comes from the word gymnos, uh, which actually means naked. Uh, the Greeks exercised, of course, in the nude, uh, and so the gymnasium was a place where you, uh, where a person goes to get naked and exercise and work out and, uh, and do other things there, right? But in the gymnasium, uh, there were other activities uh, that went on, uh, thankfully not in the nude. Um, uh, specifically, there were teachers at the gymnasia uh, who took on pupils and uh, trained them, particularly in uh, rhetoric and oratory, the most important skill, at least in ancient Athens, that a person could obtain was oratory in order to participate in politics, uh, to participate in the ecclesia or the public assembly, uh, which was the basic democratic institution of Athens. Uh, and so in the gymnasia in Athens, there were teachers of rhetoric or teachers of oratory who would instruct students. And so, you know, if you were to take a time machine back to one of these ancient Greek uh, gymnasium or gymnasia that uh, you would find uh, public lectures being delivered there and, and lots of training in oratory and things like that. Well, in a couple of these gymnasia, we have uh, some very famous educational institutions being formed. 
uh, in the 4th century BCE. Plato's Academy first, uh, which was primarily a school for, the, for training people again in rhetoric and oratory, uh, and also in logic, in thinking. Uh, and Plato, of course, is, you know, um, one of the most famous and, and important philosophers in the Western tradition. Uh, his foremost pupil was Aristotle, um, who was not originally from Athens. He was a metic or a foreigner. Uh, but Aristotle was first a, a student uh, of, Pl of Plato's and then eventually a kind of co-teacher. And then Aristotle went on to found his own school uh, called the Lyceum in Athens, um, uh, which he set up but then had to leave Athens under, under pressure. Um, but the, the academy and the Lyceum both went on for a good long time after the death of Plato and Aristotle. Uh, the academy in particular lasted for several centuries uh, and continued to train people in, uh, particularly in oratory, but in the other things that were becoming a part of the established system of education. The, again, the education of a liberalis or a free man. Now that tradition continues in Alexandria after the conquests of Alexander the Great in the in the period we call the Hellenistic era, uh, starting in the well, the, starting in the late fourth century BCE, but uh, extending through the next three or four centuries. Um, the most important educational institution there was called the Museum. Uh, and this is where the famous Library of Alexandria was. That was a part of the museum. Um, and this contained uh, hundreds of thousands of scrolls uh, with uh, different texts written on them. Uh, this was a great resource for those who were resident at the museum. But the museum was kind of like the world's first research university. Scholars were commissioned by the rulers of Alexandria, the Ptolemy, uh, Ptolemaic dynasty as they were called, to come to the museum and to create. And there are a number of important scholars who worked there. Uh, Euclid, the inventor of geometry, um, maybe the foremost among them. Uh, but they also took on pupils. Um, and this was a, a very uh, vital uh, creative educational atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Now the partakers of the Greek and or the, the chief beneficiaries long term of the Greek, the, the Greek uh, tradition of education were the Romans. Um, Romans, although they came from uh, re relatively humble circumstances in central Italy, this was originally a farming community, um, Roman patricians, as they were called, the upper crust, uh, the elites of society, um, sought to educate themselves and their offspring. Um, and as Rome came to conquer much of the Mediterranean, the Romans were exposed to the Greek tradition of education. Um, and Roman patricians would often hire Greek tutors, sometimes they were slaves, actually, uh, via the, the conquests of Rome, but they would hire these Greek tutors to teach their children um, uh, in the Greek tradition. So they would learn how to speak Greek, um, learn how to read and write uh, in Greek and also in Latin. Uh, they would learn the, you know, some of the classics, uh, Greek literary tradition, things like the Odyssey and the Iliad, uh, as well as uh, some of the philosophical traditions of Plato and Aristotle and other famous Greek figures. Um, and so this, you know, was transmitted into the Roman system. Um, there were, of course, a number of prominent uh, literary and philosophical figures in Rome as well who were mostly patricians. Um, uh, there were also a lot of Greeks living under the Romans who continued to uh, foster education and to produce, you know, new and innovative ideas. Um, and so this was the continuation, again, of that uh, uh, Greek uh, educational tradition. Now... In the Middle Ages, uh, starting really in this period called Late Antiquity, uh, with the fragmentation of Rome, uh, education, the, the, the whole Greco-Roman ancient uh, education system, um, was co-opted by the Christians. Christianity became the religion of Rome, uh, starting in the 4th century, uh, and under the uh, uh, auspices of <clears throat> the Christian emperors, uh, there were a lot of monasteries and other Christian institutions founded. Um, and uh, this became the primary uh, institutional situation for uh, the transmission of education. Now, this education was changed. Christians were often skeptical 
uh, of the Greco-Roman tradition. Um, they saw it as potentially corrosive to their more uh, spiritual-centered interests. Uh, Tertullian, one of the church fathers, uh, the Greek church fathers, uh, is famous for saying, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? That is, you know, why would a Christian who's primarily concerned with the salvation of his soul and with the proper worship of Jesus be concerned with the tradition of Homer and Plato and Aristotle and uh, Aristophanes and Sophocles and so forth? What does that have to do with anything that's important? Well, there were a lot of Christian scholars who did think it was important to continue in that tradition. Uh, they thought that the ancient Greeks and ancient Romans had a lot to teach them, uh, a lot that they could use in order to become better monks and better Christians. Uh, it was, in fact, one of these monks, uh, Cassiodorus, um, in the 6th century, who uh, sort of crystallized the system of education that we call the classic liberal arts. Uh, these are seven... Um, uh, seven disciplines, or rather seven points of study, uh, organized into two groups. Uh, so the first group is called the trivium, and you can see from the prefix there that this is a group of three subjects of study. The trivium was the basics, okay? Uh, the, the, the reading, writing, and arithmetic, or rather, uh, in this ancient setting, the grammar, rhetoric, and logic. These are the, the introductory courses of study that a, a, a novice monk um, or a, a young student in another educational setting would pursue uh, at the beginning uh, for several years grammar, that is they'd learn how to use the language, um, learn the, the basics of the language, and by this it usually meant Latin, which became the, of course the language of the educated uh, class in Western Europe. Um, uh, rhetoric, that is the effective use of language, um, that would include both written and, uh, and spoken language. Um, and so they not only learned the, the, the mechanics or the grammar of the language, but also how to use it effectively. And then finally, logic, the third uh, part of the trivium, uh, which is how to think. Right? Now, the trivium, grammar, rhetoric, and logic, um, has come to form in the modern age really the basics of general education in the American higher education system. Uh, and so we'll, we'll have more to say about that um, when we get to that topic here later in the lecture. Once a student in, the, in this medieval Christian setting had mastered the trivium, um, that is, learn how to use the language, learn how to think, uh, they would move on to what was called the quadrivium, um, which was a set of four subjects, um, and these four are mathematics, geometry, uh, they actually differentiated between math and geometry, um, music, and astronomy. Now you might wonder why would a medieval monk need to know something about astronomy? Well, um, it's, the, sub, the study of astronomy was intended uh, to help these Christians understand God's creation, to have a better comprehension of the, the kind of the whole scope of creation, the whole scope of the universe. Uh, now the quadrivium, like the trivium, was pursued through studying some basic authoritative texts. Some of these were written by Christian authors and some were uh, taken directly from the classical tradition. And so a person studying uh, astronomy would have, you know, studied the works of well, probably some of the works of Aristotle or, or the works of Ptolemy um, uh, or some of these other ancient authors who wrote on those subjects. Um, and so there was a canon of literature that went along with this tradition of the classical liberal arts. Uh, once a student had mastered all of those authoritative texts, he, um, and it usually was a he, though there were some women involved in this as well, some nuns, um, uh, but once he or she had mastered those texts, he or she would be considered educated um, and would thus be able to pursue uh, his or her uh, monastic vocation more effectively. Uh, and so this continued mostly in the monasteries of Europe all through the Middle Ages. There were other institutions that um, partook in this same system of the classical liberal arts. Uh, and extended it uh, a bit. Um, the famous Palace School of Charlemagne in the city of Aachen, 
um, in what is now northwestern Germany. Uh, Charlemagne, the uh, the great king of the Franks in the late 8th and early 9th century, set up a, a system of education throughout his empire, really for the training of officials, um, both government officials and church officials. Uh, there was often great overlap between the two. Charlemagne was in control of both church and um, and state or church and secular government. Um, there really was no division between them. And so the palace school and other other uh, institutions within the, the, the uh, educational system of Charlemagne were really intended to produce good government officials, good bureaucrats. Uh, and that continued to some extent um, into the development of cathedral schools. These are schools uh, housed in cathedrals um, in places like Paris and Chartres and Laon, uh, in, uh, in France and uh, in England and Italy, uh, in other parts of Europe. Um, and uh, the cathedral schools, uh, again, started with the liberal arts. Uh, the school masters um, would be appointed by the bishops to train the next generation of clergymen, uh, some of whom went on to careers in the church, others uh, went on to careers in the various kingdoms of Europe that developed in the high Middle Ages uh, in the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries. Um, cathedral schools, though, unlike monasteries, were... Uh, places of exploration, uh, figures like Peter Abelard and uh, uh, Peter the Lombard, um, uh, Peter Comester. For some reason, these guys are all named Peter. Uh, but uh, several leading figures embarked on new and innovative philosophical systems, uh, new ways of approaching theology. Uh, some of this had to do with a kind of reintroduction of Aristotle and, and uh, some of the parts of the classical tradition that had fallen out of use in Europe. Uh, the exposure came via the Crusades and other things. And so Europe really began to develop this very creative, um, vital uh, system of, um, uh, of education in the High Middle Ages. And that culminated in the establishment of universities. Uh, pictured here at the bottom left uh, of the slide, you can see uh, Oxford University. That was one of the universities developed in the Middle Ages. It was a daughter uh, institution of the University of Paris. Uh, but Paris, Bologna, Montpellier, Salerno, um, uh, Oxford, Cambridge, uh, Prague. Um, these are all universities that developed in the Middle Ages between the 12th and the 14th centuries. Uh, and by the end of the Middle Ages, there were dozens of these institutions, um, all, again, focused on training in the liberal arts, though with some students who went into studies that uh, extended beyond that in specific topics like law or medicine or especially theology. Um, it was in the medieval universities that the whole system of um, exams uh, that remain part of Western education was developed. Uh, also the system of degrees, bachelor's degrees and master's degrees and doctorate degrees uh, were all part of this university system in the Middle Ages. Uh, but again, this is largely again this is largely in the tradition of the liberal arts. That was the basic course of study uh, for a bachelor's degree um, and most students didn't go beyond that. Uh, those who did would, again, take a more focused study of theology or law or medicine or, or uh, natural philosophy, what we would call science, uh, or other things. Now, uh, over the course of the um, uh, 17th and 18th centuries, we see the educational system that was begun in Europe transmitted to America. Uh, and one of the spurs for this was, of course, the Protestant Reformation, starting in the 16th century, uh, led by figures like Martin Luther and John Calvin and Ulrich Zwingli, um, and eventually John Wesley and uh, other uh, leading lights of the Protestant Reformation. Um, uh, perhaps the key idea behind the Protestant Reformation was that anyone could be a religious authority if he mostly he, uh, there were some women involved in this, I suppose, but mostly men, uh, if he were to pursue a study of the Bible, that the Bible itself contained all of the authority necessary. And so, you know, uh, as a result of the Protestant Reformation, there were a lot of people who became ministers. Uh, all that it took to become a minister was to, you know, learn how to read and write and to study the Bible. Um, 
to the point where they could then preach, uh, offer their own interpretations of it. There's a great democratization of education, whereas it had been confined mostly, you know, through necessity, not through any um, specific program of keeping, you know, education away from the common people, but just the, the sheer utility of it um, uh, in the Middle Ages was uh, focused on training clergymen and training government ministers. Well, with the Protestant Reformation, more and more people sought to become educated. Um, so this obviously was going to change the way that education was uh, distributed. Now, it was largely still, uh, all the way until the 19th century, the province of the elites. And so some of the uh, great intellectual achievements of the scientific revolution, um, the period of enlightenment, happened through things called learned societies. Uh, in the upper right here of the slide, we have an image of, um, you know, what a meeting of one of these learned societies might have looked like. Uh, uh, the most famous of these was the Royal Society uh, in England, though there were similar kinds of institutions on the continent. And eventually in the Americas with the establishment of the, uh, the British colonies uh, in what is now the United States and Canada. Uh, these learned societies, uh, groups of scholars, some of whom had affiliations with universities like Oxford and Cambridge, uh, others uh, of whom were independent scholars, got together, um, uh, shared ideas, you know, read what they had written uh, to each other. Uh, they also started publications, so really the whole system of scholarly journals begins with these learned societies. Um, and, you know, again, these are, have some association with, with universities, and uh, they were independent of that uh, as well. Now, uh, as a result of the Protestant Reformation, um, the main purpose of universities um, uh, became, was still the, the training of uh, ministers and of clergy. Uh, but um, you know, many of these new institutions were founded uh, and associated with, uh, founded by and associated with different Protestant denominations. Some were still Catholic, um, and some were you know associated with the Church of England and, and other things. Uh, but this began. Uh, so th this is where we have to look uh, at. This is where we have to. This is the context in which we have to examine. Uh, the first universities in the Americas. Um, and so Harvard College, as it was called, uh, was founded in 1636. Uh, it was modeled after, after Oxford and Cambridge, um, but uh, was intended primarily to train young men for the ministry in the Puritan religion, uh, the, the, the Puritan form of the Church of England. Uh, which, of course, I'm at Boston, um, was a uh, Puritan foundation, a Puritan colony. Um, and it's not coincidental that uh, Harvard was founded in a place that they called Cambridge um, because uh, that's the strong association with these great universities in England. Uh, Yale and William and Mary uh, and Princeton and Brown and Rutgers uh, and all of these early colleges and universities were also founded for a similar reason, associated with one or another Protestant denomination um, and primarily for the training of ministers. The one exception to this, the one the early university that was the exception, was the University of Pennsylvania, uh, founded by Benjamin Franklin in association with some others who uh, lived in Philadelphia. Um, and uh, it was not oriented that way. Rather, it was, you know, intended to be a kind of institution of secular education, but um, it was the exception rather than the rule. Now, uh, that takes us to, and I'm, I'm skipping over, glossing over a few things here, but that takes us to the early 19th century, um, where the, um, one of the, the key developments uh, in education happened, not in the United States or in uh, France or England, um, but rather in Germany. Germany really um, was the place where research universities uh, began to establish themselves as a model of higher education. That is, uh, 
in educational institutions primarily for the purpose of performing original research, uh, of publishing uh, papers and articles and books on that original research, and uh, you know the lectures and uh, classes would be then given by people who were primarily renowned for their research. Well, this model of the research university, which we could, you know, take all the way back to antiquity with the museum in Alexandria, uh, but this German development caught on everywhere. And institutions like, well, uh, established institutions like Oxford and Cambridge or Harvard and Yale began to model themselves after these German institutions like Heidelberg um, uh, and uh, the University of Munich um, and uh, other famous institutions in Germany. Uh, and so that became the model. Now that, uh, in some ways, was in tension with the educational institutions in <clears throat> the Americas as they had existed up to that point, which were, again, primarily for the training of clergymen. Um, and so, you know, there were some educational institutions in, in the United States in the 19th century who followed the, the kind of old model. Uh, and others who followed the research university model. No matter which model they chose, all American educational institutions began with training in the liberal arts. In fact, you know, going back to these uh, institutions created for the training of clergymen, that was still the basic program of education. They still learned grammar, rhetoric, and logic, and math, geometry, astronomy, and music. Um, and uh, they might extend beyond that into the study of theology or something like that, but it began still with the basic classical liberal arts training. Um, where that began to change, really, is in the late 19th century with the establishment of schools uh, primarily for training people in professions. Now, the most famous of these were law and medical schools. Um, previous to the late 19th century, people uh, who wanted to be lawyers didn't go to law school. Um, there, were, there were no such things. Uh, there was no such thing as law school. Uh, they were trained in the liberal arts in a college or a university, um, and then they went on to apprentice with somebody who was a lawyer. They learned how to do that. Um, and uh, through those means became lawyers. Many of the founding fathers of the United States were lawyers trained in, in just this fashion. Uh, some of them did go to institutions in Europe, particularly the uh, what were called the Inns of Court uh, in England. Uh, these are institutions for training uh, people to, you know, to try cases before Parliament and before judges in England. Uh, so kind of proto-law schools, uh, and there were some of these in the United States in the 19th century too. Uh, but starting in the late 19th century, universities began to found law schools for the training of lawyers specifically. Uh, there were even institutions who, that were only law schools, not, not associated with other universities. Uh, it was the same thing with medical schools. Uh, medicine up to this point had been uh, you know, in, in medieval Europe, it was a learned discipline, but it was a bookish discipline. It was not something that people practiced in. Uh, they would learn the basic authoritative texts, um, uh, and then, you know, it, they would sort of theorize about medicine uh, rather than seeing patients. Uh, uh, practical medicine was done by, well, people who, uh, you know, had learned this uh, via apprenticeship. Um, in fact, Barbers, uh, those who cut hair, often would double as simple surgeons uh, doing basic surgery and other kind of practical medicine. Well, uh, medical schools in the United States, starting in the late 19th century, uh, really focused on intensive medical training. You can see in the image in the lower right here, uh, you know, a, a teacher of some kind uh, in a medical school with students gathered around looking, of course, at a cadaver here, probably doing dissections, learning practical medicine, learning anatomy and physiology, um, and uh, also practicing, you know, on patients, uh, doing practicums, uh, rotations as they're called, or clinicals. Uh, 
Uh, really, that began, that whole system of medical education began in the late 19th century. Now, uh, where, where does that leave us with the 20th century? Well, we, we still have these old elite universities. Um, you know, these then establish networks. Um, uh, this is where we get things like the Ivy League. And this is not just for athletic competition, uh, though that is part of it. Uh, this is also, you know, uh, these are uh, organizations of universities that have like-minded, uh, that are like-minded, that have similar purposes. Uh, so the Ivy League, um, and then these various organizations of state universities. This is where the, you know, the Big Ten and the SEC and these other things come from. Uh, and so we have these old elite universities. Um, but uh, with the... Um, passage of a couple of uh, laws or a couple of acts in Congress. Um, in, first in 1862 uh, and then again in 1890, these are called the Moral Land Grant Colleges Acts. Uh, states were given a lot of money by the federal government to establish what were called land grant colleges and universities. That is, they were to take from the, the land uh, controlled by the federal government and give them to institutions that were uh, identified as the recipients of that by the state legislatures. So many of the state university systems really go back to these, this land-grant colleges act, or rather these, these two acts in the late 19th century. Uh, a lot of the more famous state universities, like the University of Florida, uh, Ohio State University, uh, Michigan State, Purdue, um, uh, the University of Illinois. You can look, uh, if you can read the, the map here, you can see the, all of these uh, dots in red here were land-grant institutions from this 1862 Act. Um, and, you know, many of these followed the research university model, but many of them began, and this was really the purpose of the Land-Grant uh, land College Act, um, Many of them began to offer training or to focus on training in more practical things, particularly agriculture, because the United States was still very much a nation of farmers, but also the mechanical arts, uh, engineering, um, uh, and, and things that were, again, practical. Right, um, and so it's really with the establishment of these land grant institutions that we get the whole tradition of professional training. Uh, this is still you can see this in the uh, the names of some of the universities down here. Uh, the chief recipient of the land grant college act in Texas was, of course, Texas A and M University, um, and that stands for uh, Texas Agricultural and Mechanical University. Uh, you can see, so you can see even from the uh, from the name of the university, this tradition of kind of professional training that was offered. And many of these state universities were originally known as, you know, the agricultural school. Um, Penn State uh, here was, of course, one of the um, uh, the land grant institutions. Uh, it was known originally as something like the, the Pennsylvania Agricultural High School. Uh, and it evolved into Penn State University over time. Um, and so this was more, uh, I don't want to call it vocational training, but kind of like that. Uh, students would go to these universities to learn how to be better farmers or to learn how to uh, innovate in agriculture or to learn how to be engineers. Um, and uh, the whole tradition of liberal arts was still the basis of this. They still began with that, or this evolved into what we call general education, uh, but really, the point of going to an institution like this was primarily to, you know, study one of these practical disciplines to, to get training in one's intended profession. Uh, and this coincides in time, for those of you who are business majors, and I imagine, I mean, given the demographics of Flagler that many of you are, this coincides with, in time with what is known as the managerial revolution. Uh, this really is kind of the late 19th and early 20th centuries where the, the, the theories um, and uh, sort of practical systems that were discovered partly at these universities and partly through simple practical application uh, began to be studied and applied. Uh, and so this is where the whole um, study of management comes from, is this managerial revolution. 
the people you know began to to go to university to study how to manage people um and uh, you know we can go back to uh, authoritative texts in this regard things like um you know Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations and and other things that were written in earlier eras those became the the basic texts for studying management um and that caught on as a, you know, uh, given uh, all of the kind of revolutionary things happening during the Gilded Age in America, that really caught on as a, uh, a subject of study um, and became a, you know, an essential kind of uh, qualification for one to go into management in these burgeoning uh, corporations uh, in the United States, things like Standard Oil and, you know, the Carnegie Steel Corporation and um uh, other you know major corporations would would hire these trained managers coming out of colleges and universities. Uh, this this practice focus on practical training and professionalization also uh, extended to the realm of education with the setting up of lots of teachers colleges all over the country. Uh, given the you know the the growing population of the United States, the westward expansion, um, and also the desire to uh, achieve universal education, uh, at least uh, primary and then secondary education. There was a great need to train more and more teachers to take over classrooms all over the United States. And so these teacher colleges were <clears throat> uh, one means to do that, the chief means to accomplish this. Um, in fact, Flagler College started out as a, a kind of teacher's college, and there's a reason that the education program here has been so heavily emphasized and has been so popular over time. That's really kind of in the DNA uh, of our institution. Uh, now, another associated development, and in some ways uh, inimical to this focus on professionalization, is the growth of graduate education in the United States. Um, uh, starting in the, the last couple of decades of the 19th century and following in uh, along the model of the German research university, uh, many of these older established institutions, but increasingly even some of these land-grant universities began to establish large graduate programs. And in fact, there were universities founded specifically for that purpose. Um, yeah, so Johns Hopkins, uh, Clark University in uh, uh, in Massachusetts, um, and several others, you know, focused more heavily on graduate education than on undergraduate education. In some cases, didn't even offer undergraduate education. Again, the purpose here is to increase knowledge, to produce original research, to publish, um, uh, to do experiments. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, with government contracts to uh, discover things that would have uh, an application to industry, to defense, um, uh, to other things. Um, and so that um, focus on this, these higher forms of education didn't necessarily cancel out the tradition of liberal arts, but it did um, mean that universities shifted their focus away from these kind of basic subjects of study on to much more advanced things. Uh, near universal college education, or at least the availability of college education, uh, was not uh, even a dream or you know much less a reality until after World War II. With the GI Bill starting in the late 1940s where military veterans uh, were given free college tuition um, and uh, even room and board in, in many cases uh, supported to, to, to uh, obtain an education. Uh, and of course there were a lot of these, um, millions of these after the Second World War. And then through the Great Society programs uh, of the 1960s, which brought things like Pell Grants and more uh, available student loans from the federal government and things like this, more and more people began to go to university. And so no longer was higher education something uh, that was available only for wealthy elites. Now it became possible for just about anyone to go to college. And so that leaves us with a number of issues. We have these legacies, right? Um, uh, liberalis, for instance, uh, to, to start out, I should say, uh, liberalis. The free man, the elite, 
uh, the one who had privilege in society uh, would gain the liberal arts education in order to cement his position. Um, but that, uh, with the establishment of this near universal availability of college education, no longer was that necessarily the ideal or the desire. Rather, many people sent their children to college or university, uh, often at great sacrifice, though with the help from uh, these, from the GI Bill or from Great Society programs, uh, would send their child to college with the idea that they could get a practical education, that they could uh, use that education then to get a good job, uh, to achieve professional training. Um, and, uh, you know, many of these uh, kind of first generation college students went to university or college with that in mind rather than gaining this this long established education in the liberal arts they wanted professional training and in the united states there was a whole tradition you know that um uh that, that emphasized that and so we have this clash of tradition and modernity on the one hand also a kind of clash between the whole liberal arts tradition and this new um, focus on professional training. Now, I don't think that these are necessarily inimical to each other. Um, I don't think that, they, that the, they're mutually exclusive, that the one cancels the other out. Uh, but that's one question that we have to ask as we embark on a course like Keystone, which is very much in the liberal arts tradition. Um, what's the purpose of this? This is not a course that has anything to do with professional training. We're not here to give you the skills that you're going to need as you go on uh, to your careers, um, uh, meaning this, the very specific skills that are pertinent to your chosen field of vocation. Rather, this course is intended to give the person, uh, to give the student a kind of education in this whole liberal arts tradition. Uh, the, the classical liberal arts tradition in uh, grammar and rhetoric and logic, uh, teaching you how to think, how to write, how to express yourself effectively. Um, now, though, there were those, of course, who would argue that that's essential, that any, any profession is going to require that a person is able to communicate effectively and to think effectively. Um, and so that's a question you have to ask yourself, and I look forward to seeing a discussion uh, in the discussion boards for this class uh, about this very topic. There's also this desire, um, and this course, you know, is uh, one of the results of this desire, this desire to be interdisciplinary in our approach. That um, <clears throat> the, the thought here is that, uh, you know, maybe we shouldn't confine ourselves to the methodologies and the skill set of a single discipline, um, but that we should be fluent in and convert, at least conversant in uh, the methodologies of a variety of disciplines. Uh, and so in this class, we will, you know, look at some, uh, or we will take the approach of uh, philosophy from time to time and literary criticism and uh, history uh, and a number of other disciplines, um, though you know, I suppose that could be seen as, as somewhat artificial. This, again, is uh, something that I look forward to discussing with you in the discussion boards. Uh, the whole project of general education, which is really the outgrowth of the, of the, the classical liberal arts tradition, is that necessary? Or should students just study their major? Should they get this practical professional training? Um, that's open for debate. That's certainly something that I'd like to see uh, all of you weigh in on. And then finally, the identity of Flagler College. Flagler College is a college in the liberal arts tradition, though by the way that these things are classified, it's really not a liberal arts college. Um, you know, a definition of a liberal arts college is uh, an institution wherein uh, more than, I, I forget what the exact percentage is, but something like more than half of the students major in the disciplines that are associated with the classical liberal arts. And so there you know, maybe a lot, of, a lot of English majors, humanities majors, history majors, political science majors, uh, and so forth and so on. Flagler College is very much an institution that uh, wherein students pursue degrees in business management, education, uh, communications, um, uh, 
though communications is a little more problematic here. It kind of bridges the divide between liberal arts and professional training. Uh, but uh, the, the sorts of disciplines that uh, would be classified under that professional rubric. Um, and many of you probably came here with that in mind, that you wanted to major in education or you wanted to major in uh, business management. Um, and so, you know, and then yet here you are in the Keystone Seminar trying to navigate your way through the liberal arts. Um, I do think that there is a utility to that. I do think there's some good that can come of that, but I can see, and I've seen it over the years, that students are frustrated at times with this. Um, hopefully this will be a productive exercise uh, and this will help you uh, have a better sense of, you know, uh, your own identity. Um, and will, you know, the, the, the studying in the liberal arts tradition here, developing the skills of the liberal arts tradition, uh, will give you a uh, an advantage, no matter what your chosen major, or your chosen profession is. Uh, I look forward to talking with you again in the discussion boards. Thank you.